Okay, we're starting up the show here. Here's our magic light bulb, clickety clack typewriters, and wobbly things and stuff. Telephone dials, typewriter, QWERTY keys, wow, clocks, analog, wee. And here we are at Troubles in Paradise, my website, tortukanwordpress.com. Everybody should be having that. Why do I have to keep on repeating that? I don't know, because I just like to. Anyway, there's the uh, stop sharing for the moment. And our today's uh, show, uh, I am now kind of widescreen because I have a new camera and uh, a new lighting and a new microphone from uh, um, Cirrus's wonderful help last week uh, in um, uh, getting everybody to um, uh, plump up some money to actually get me up to speed so I can do the audio book of uh, the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg and theoretically audio book of Slam Dunk and any other little projects going. So um, just by myself at the moment, put out some links, whether anybody pops in or not, we'll find out in due course. But the uh, uh, main show is on the road. Uh, there's a whole slew of people, I'm sure, not watching me because uh, Nathaniel Jensen is debating Herman Mays over on um, uh, Steve McRae's show. Uh, and uh, naturally, they would be paying attention to that, not me. So, yeah, I'm maybe not going to get too many audience today. Anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll be watching that one later on because I'm curious to see what the creationist has to say and what information gets brought up. I'm going to be approaching it from a methods direction. Uh, oh, hello, Azrael. Hello. Hi. Shut up and take my money. I'm perfectly happy to. You can find the link to the GoFundMe in there and and, and you can find the link to a slam dunk to buy book and all of that. So uh, all of that's a, a cheap crave and plug and it's not even halfway through the show. Anyway. Uh, as you may know, I'm doing contested bones uh, analysis, which a uh, uh, critic of creationism had stumbled across, but did not want to spend the time to do and offered to send me a free copy of the book to do. And since I have no money, I go, hey, I'm happy to add that to my collection. So I've been analyzing all this. We're about halfway through at the moment. Uh, just to give you a repeat breeze of the late of the whole structure of what's going on. Uh, I analyzed, uh, oh, uh, uh, Ezra, does this already have your book? Well, excellent. Make sure to review it and tell everybody you know about uh, Slam Dunk. Uh, anyway, um, uh, I'm approaching this from a methods direction to kind of show how methods works and why it's the killer app and why you learn stuff in the process of it and you improve your argument and learn better why everybody else is screwed up. Um, the very first thing that I noticed about it was the fact that there's no index. There uh, are footnotes, but no bibliography, so you don't know what's been cited and how often and what. So what I've basically done is uh, construct a spreadsheet where I, and a bibliography where I plug in all that information and find out what pages everything is done on so I can find out what's going on. And I've been uh, covering the results of what I've been doing each week uh, as I plow through it page by page by page. Hi, Brian Stevens. Hello. Um, he, listening but busy with stuff behind a bit. Yes, that's it's been a busy week for me and a whole bunch of stuff. There was weird stuff with the credit union that double billed me. And so I had a panic attack uh, wondering about whether or not it was going to throw my social security check into a, 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 a it's been a busy week. Uh, plus, I'm working on the new book um, with uh, Jackson Wheat on uh, a vaporizing the answers in Genesis bunch uh, with their answers books. And I'm doing the, the radiometric cha uh, dating chapter. In fact, Quite by coincidence, Paul G was doing a thing on radiometric dating, and, and I was vetting his thing, and I was bringing up some of the points that I had made a note of. So, so hopefully some of that will get in there, too. Radioactive dating of diamonds and uh, accelerated radioactive decay. There's a lot of weird subjects and stuff going on. Uh, Jackson Wheat, who uh, is my co-author on that, is busy with his classwork and that, so he isn't able to uh, uh, join the show today. And so it's just me and my mug uh, here in better definition with uh, a light, uh, funnel and all of that. And so now you can see in higher resolution how desiccated and pathetic I am as, as a, about to be 66 year old thing. And behind me, a, a bigger view of uh, my old DVD and, and uh, CD collection that I collected over decades and decades when I still had money to work with on things uh, and um, uh, proceeding accordingly. Anyway, uh, back to contested bones. Uh, they're still obsessing on the idea in, in these chapters that Australopithecines were just apes. They were like chimpanzees or like gorillas or like apes, but not people. They weren't bipedal, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Rupi has to really tiptoe extremely carefully 
through his own technical literature that says exactly the opposite. So he relies on a very small number of older sources that were uh, taking the position that uh, Australopithecines were chiefly arboreal. There's basically only a couple uh, paleoanthropologists who were pushing that line 20 years ago, and they're reprising it again and again and again. And even their primary sources routinely um, would say that they were bipedal animals, but had a capacity for climbing. And that was an interesting issue and still is. I don't think any paleoanthropologist doubts that Australopithecines were pretty damn good climbers. The question is, they're also facultative bull, uh, or as standard uh, bipeds. And the physical anatomy and all that in the 20 years uh, since the older sources they've been relying on have only confirmed that. I put up a bunch of direct links because uh, you can't check what I'm saying unless you can see the original material. So uh, I, I always have to find material that's available, open access for everybody that you just go link, bam, not behind a firewall or anything. And there were about three or four papers that fell into that ballpark. Uh, some of them was really tendentious and snotty. Uh, it was recently found um, that uh, one of the little bones in the vertebrae in the Lucy skeleton actually was from a baboon species that was living in Africa at the time. By the way, not modern baboons, just one of the ancestral ones. And uh, this um, uh, was a fascinating analysis, and it showed how they, the meticulous the workers are. They were, uh, Rupi and Sanford were treating this as if, aha, there, how much more of those bones are actually something from uh, apes? Well, none of them are. They're all from Lucy, as the paper very meticulously demonstrated that this was just this one little lone thing that it easily, uh, they're, they're very easily confused for um, uh, the standard bone, but you had to be really, really super stickler. And those scientists are really, really super sticklers. Uh, and Rupi and Sanford are not really, really super sticklers. They're just scavenging around for little bits and pieces of stuff. So all of those papers then you can follow up on, you can get a, a, a look-see at their methodology and how they rely upon secondary sources uh, and riff off of material. There's a, a, a piece by Owen that uh, was just referring to a perfectly fine technical paper, and they were riffing off of it. And so I put the that link and also the original paper that they were talking about, which was this Alamesged paper uh, that they had misrepresented before. So um, I, I think I discussed it in one of the previous evolution hours. And so I put the link up to it again so people can make a look at it uh, if they wish. Um, Oh, thank you. With I apparently look fine. Uh, same horrible resolution, though. Well, it's uh, so long as I'm I'm clear, and also so long as the sound is good, because this is a higher resolution microphone system. I'm not using my old microphone. I'm listening to it over the headphones. Uh, although I don't have anybody in here to listen to, so I, I'm not getting any feedback on it. Um, but um, the the new microphone had to be acquired because I needed something with higher resolution to be able to record stuff for uh, audiobook level that Cyrus um, is helping me on. He was uh, just a wonderful, I think a great fundraiser on that. So I didn't know whether or not he might be taxing the bandwidth of my computer. And uh, I always have to make sure that all of the other uh, applications are shut down so I don't have anything competing uh, for the memory. And um, uh, I'm, I'm just running off of what I got available here. Um, the, um, the whole issue of human evolution is the one that that anti-evolutionists, not just young earth creationists, are obsessed about. That's the big deal. And even if they may be talking about trilobite eyes or sauropod vertebrae or some other issue, uh, it's functionally all about human evolution because they have to draw that line in the sand that makes human beings super duper special and not evolve no matter what. And because modern evolutionary theory doesn't distinguish between humans and others, everything evolved, we included, so all of our anatomy, all of our genes, morphology can only be understood by understanding our lineage. Uh, that means they've got to go after lots of other evolutionary notions in order to maintain that line in the sand. And of course, uh, young earth creationists have a particularly rigid framework to deal with with their kinds because we must be a separate kind, just us. But if they treat species as kinds, they've got way too many to put on Noah's Ark. So they've got to have actually kinds be families, typically, which is the old traditional definition of kind. Uh, but if that's true, we're part of the primate family. So we and Bonzo the ape now blump back together again. Uh oh, can't have that. So double standards are just in, inherent in young earth creationist baromenology, but don't show up in old earth creationist or intelligent design uh, uh, analyses because they don't do systematics at all. They could care less about any of this stuff.
you don't find anything all on it. Um, uh, Tara says, let the fun begin. Hello, Teresa. Yeah, she managed to make it. I, I, I just um, uh, had a delightful time uh, um, showing Giant uh, at her place yesterday. So um, we get to, um, she hadn't seen a lot of these older movies that I have in my collection. And so it's a chance of uh, exposing her to James Dean and uh, a, a ridiculously young and gorgeous uh, uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson and all the rest. And it's just a rip snorting story. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing on film uh, lore here. But the whole point then about a source methods analysis approach is um, and you can make any argument to jolly well please. If the creationist wants to present an argument, fine. What's their evidence? How much of the evidence are they paying attention to? How rigorous are they in dealing with it? And in drawing this line in the sand that Australopithecines are just gorilla-ish, ape-ish things and cherry picking teeny little snippets when they don't look at the whole animal and also the trajectory involved. A chronology is not a game that anti-evolutionists do easily. They don't think in map of time sequence at all. Uh, this is independent of whether you're a young earth creationist or not. I've noticed this as a pathology that they just don't like putting things in order into this is what we think happened and then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. You don't get that at all anywhere in the anti-evolution literature. Instead, it's little pot shots and tunnel vision in on little tiny bliplets. And uh, that's about all you get. Uh, I see some tiny flickering in the thing as I move my hand around. I don't know whether or not that's by um, altering some weird thing or vibrating off of something or connecting up. I don't know. It's Maybe it's my Clydon rays. Who knows? Anyway, um, oh, uh, and I'll try to, since I have no one else in the room, I'll have to jump back and forth periodically. Um, you know, yeah, frustrated atheist said, would love to join, but the phone is about to die. Oh, heal the phone, recharge the phone. We are now dependent upon our little, our little things. I, I must say I, I make useful use out of the um, uh, smartphone that I got as a uh, Christmas present um, that brought me up to the 21st century. And because I'm on the food assistance, I was able to get free phone service too. Not that I do many telephone calls even before, but at, I, I was completely incommunicado and that drove my niece nuts. Uh, where she thought, what if you catch on fire or something, you can't call 911. So um, the, uh, the thing is, is that those little devices have a ton of really neat little apps that are available and uh, a lot of things on uh, uh, science websites and others that mean that even when my computer is shut down, my little Wi-Fi connection, uh, it, at which I make a point of, uh, that that gets higher priority over food even, that since I'm functionally doing my work on the, online, I have to maintain that no matter what. Uh, otherwise, I'm really screwed. Um, and it allows me to get all sorts of access to a lot of information in various ways that's kind of convenient to um, uh, to locate. And then plus, I use it for my book research and that, too, for the, the novel of hunting up things and Google mapping my way through pieces of real estate to find out what things look like from the ground level and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a handy device. The thing is, is that our devices are only important to the extent that we use them for something. And the thing that is so gobsmackingly stupid about um, uh, the, the anti-evolution movement is how lazy they are. Uh, I'm gonna be debating Kent Hovind tomorrow, um, uh, theoretically, and uh, I'll wanna point that out, how lazy he is. It's 2018, nobody has an excuse for being unable to find primary source technical literature these days. It's literally a mouse click away. And it just requires that you have the skill set to be able to know how to search and know what it is you're looking at. But creationists have no standards. They're looking at it from, does it say what I want to be true? Uh-oh, it doesn't, so it must be wrong. It's fake news. And that's, no, 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 no. You have to start working out uh, what the data field are and on what basis you do it and have standards for testing whether or not uh, controversial positions are well documented or not. And it's exactly the same source methods that I'm doing here which is you can make any argument you jolly well please, but what evidence do you present for it? When I look up the primary source that they cited and it doesn't say quite what they claim it does, in one instance there was, a, I couldn't put a link to it because it's not available full text online, uh, it's frustrating. But um, they were, there's this thing, in fact, uh, I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in the previous um, uh, parts of the series with this creationist, C. Brown, who was briefly on the show but couldn't shut up long enough to actually have a conversation, um, that he um, was still pushing the creationist line that Rupi and Sanford do, 
he actually went out and bought Rupee and Sanford's book. Um, he won't buy my book, but he's got Rupee and Sanford. So they make money and I don't. Um, but uh, he's pushing their line that Australopithecines were knuckle walkers. And he cites this one old paper that did not claim that, that Australopithecines were knuckle walkers. It only claimed that there was a feature in the knuckle lay, the uh, wrist layout that was consistent with an ancestor of that group being a knuckle walker. And that this was a tiny retained feature that had been lurking inside of that particular bone structure. And it, it's, it's a possibility. Um, and it's still regarded as theoretically possible, but um, the paper itself had never claimed that Australopithecines were knuckle walkers. And yet here again, um, one of the pages in here, they were citing, I'll, I'll see if I can find the little spot since I'm all by myself here and have plenty of time to waste everybody's time. Um, it's, um, for those of you who are uh, super duper uh, concerned, let me see, it's on, um, uh there we go yes it's on page 115 that's where i left off where they say um uh richmond and Strait further reported in nature that lucy had locking wrists inferred from the distal radius a feature seen only in chimps and gorillas which allows them to walk on their knuckles these findings show that lucy engaged in quadrupedal locomotory behavior moving about on all fours like chimps and not on two feet like humans and um uh, that was uh, to a, a paper from uh, uh, 2000, uh, volume 404, uh, pages 382, 385, and, and you can find it at college libraries and so forth and so on. I'll be happy to put a reference up to it um, in the, uh, chats or whatever if, if anyone is obsessed with it. Uh, but the point is, is that when you read the original paper, it did not claim what they claimed it claimed. And that's not good. That's entirely inappropriate. And that is a measure of the behavior that's going on. Approximately a little over half of their argument is uh, authority quoting. Um, uh, and then of the technical literature that they do have, uh, way over a third of it is misrepresented in just that way. So it's a terribly sloppy work. Uh, looking over into the live chat here, um, Yep, 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 yep. Oh, uh, frustrated Athea. The other day, Nephilim Free was trying to explain scientific jargon, but his scientific source was Fox News. Fox News, RJ, didn't even have the goal uh, to use a, a scientific journal. Well, uh, um, uh, Nephilim Free is not going to be using science journals here. He's, he's too much of a bottom feeder. That, that ain't going to work. Uh, by the way, Fox News pops up uh, in uh, the next installment of the discussion, which is regarding to Dinesh D'Souza, which uh, uh, I suppose maybe I can get to that since I'm all by my little lonesome here. Uh, let me put my little shameless plug in. We're, we're a little early on it, but I'm, I'm pathetic. And what else can I do? Uh, I have to go through my rigmarole of um, putting up the screen share and all of that. And like so, and then we get our infinite regress. And then there we go. There's our uh, tip patrons, um, uh, Stephen and Marigail and Dyer and Andrew and Eat and Yui and Mona and Hendrel and Jen and Jody and Daniel and Ralph and Eric and Benjamin and Staggles and Alex Stone Sirs and Totus Real and Everett and Paul. Thank you all um, uh, for helping out on the project. I realize that a lot of this is symbolic by virtue of the fact that Patreon is as slow as molasses on actually getting money out to people when they're at my low level. So uh, it's symbolic, but you stepped up independent of how much I get. And so you get the things on the Patreon. So I make a point of that. Um, if you really want to help the project in a lightning fast way that actually gets money to me and with less of a of a hassle, uh, the GoFundMe.com DC Go um, GoFundMe thing is there for everybody to work with. So there's my um, shameless plug, and we'll stop sharing, and we'll get that out of the way. Um, so the the uh, wonderful world of Fox News. Um, in in the world of Fox News, you have to draw a distinction between the news division and the pundits, and it's the pundits that Rupert Murdoch is actually. Uh, completely controlling. In fact, in the deal that he's making, I think at ABC, uh, Disney, that's trying to uh, buy out uh, the news division uh, and uh, all of that Fox new, uh, movie division, 21st Century Fox and all that, they're buying everything except the pundits because Murdoch wants, that's why he founded Fox News, was to have a little coterie of places where uh, hyper right-wing conservatives could echo chamber. Uh, and and change people's minds and have President Trump watch it. 
Uh, and so um, there are perfectly valid, fine reporters at Fox News, but that's not necessarily what goes on in the punditry division. And um, uh, Dinesh D'Souza, if you've been following me, I've, I've over the um, many months, I've occasionally called attention to Dinesh D'Souza, who if you're unfamiliar with him, you really should kind of pay attention to him because he's a, a hyper conservative, very popular right wing propagandist who really hopes by his books and films to um, affect politics. He managed to uh, not dislodge Obama during either of his terms. He's jumped on the Trump bandwagon. He was uh, kind of iffy about Trump to begin with, but now that he's in play, he's just gung-ho for Trump. And he definitely wants to secure the Republican majority to make sure that the, the right kinds of people get put on the Supreme Court and all of that. So he has definitely got a political ax to grind. He's also a flaming Tortugan in that he has addiction to secondary sources. He is a hyper ideologue that information just deflects right off of him. Um, he has a patina of, of scholarly quality. It looks a little bit like a, a, a patrician nebbish with an overbite. Uh, and so he, he doesn't raise his temper. He's always scholarly sounding. But as soon as you start investigating his source base, you can see that he's just as bad as flat earthers. He relies on sloppy secondary sources. He doesn't fact check a damn thing. Uh, I put stuff up in earlier videos to um, uh, the, the Breitbart uh, posting that he did of an excerpt of his big lie book and the fact that a third of his footnotes in it were wrong. Uh, they didn't say what he claimed they did, including a completely imaginary Margaret Sanger quote that he could have found out about really easy. So Dinesh is, is from a methods point of view, um, a terrible scholar. And yet he believes himself, Dunning-Kruger on steroids, to be fabulously um, um, superb, and he's never made a mistake, and he's never been caught in any errors at all. I mean, does this sound familiar? Yeah, Tortugans are, are impervious to evidence. And he has never been able to acknowledge that Donald Trump has ever said anything that's inaccurate either. But on the particular area that he bumps into, he's, uh, Dinesh says he's okay with evolution. You can't get him to talk about it much. The, the few times he has bumped into it, he sounded kind of critical of evolution and or the idea that there's some sort of theistic component to it and that the Bible is really correct after all, and he's not really going to think about it too much. He's a little iffy on intelligent design. He's very, very vague. But on climate science, he's jumped off the gangplank repeatedly. He thinks climate science is a hoax. The earth is not warming. There's nothing whatsoever to do with that. And when you look at what few and far between sources he puts up, and he has already a couple that I've spotted when, because I follow him on Twitter, uh, you'd think the guy would simply block me by now, but you know, he, he, he's, he's, he's honest in that respect, um, that he relies on secondary sources uh, and tendentious secondary sources, stuff from um, flax from the Heartland Institute and posts that he's found uh, that say what he wants to be true. He's just miles away from the technical field. And again, the technical literature is available pretty much full scale uh, these days. Um, I, I like to throw um, one recent one, Noah Diffenbaugh. I suppose I should type him in here on here and you can Google search him. Uh, he's um, from, uh, uh, I think, Noah. Um, and um, he's uh, done research on um, the current drought forest fire cycles in uh, California. And there's been stuff he's done on you know, proceedings of the National Academy of Science and science and nature and all that. And it's all, all of his stuff is open access uh, if you hunt around for it. And um, it's that uh, they've worked out that the current cycle is unnatural that it has been spurred on that the, in the old days you had drought cycles occurring fairly regularly over very, very long periods of time. It's, it's a lot of desert and stuff around in California. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, ooh, Andy Deluvi and Athey, I'll, I'll, I'll zip this up real quickly on Noah, uh, that, that uh, the sh upshot is, is that California's drought cycles are directly traceable to climate change. And they've gotten worse and persistent to where you're in functionally a, a 360, uh, 365 day fire cycle in California, precisely because of this concatenation of drought cycles with uh, temperature ranges. And so a bunch of wonderful work on that. But anyway, um, uh, Andy Lubin Atheist says, Jim, uh, do you think they are all liars or are some of them honest? Oh, I think the vast majority of people who believe things that aren't true are honest. 
in the sense they believe it to be true. They're not lying. They're not dissembling. And this, I have big knockdown dragouts with a lot of people on, on my side of the fence that just can't believe that Andrew Snelling or Kent Hovind or somebody else is, can't, is other than a liar. You must know that you're wrong. And I say, no, they don't know they're wrong. They think they're right. And when you look at it from the source methods direction, you can see how their brains deflect around relevant information. And the whole essence of that Tortukan model of the mind is how do people manage to not address things they don't want to think about? Uh, there's a, a, it's known, there's a bunch of terms. Confirmation bias uh, is obviously one of them and uh, a conflict resolution and all of these things that are popping up in the brain. Um, in fact, I think I put up a tweet a little bit ago, brand new paper that just popped out, also open access, on the direct relationship between teleological thinking in the brain and conspiracy theory mindedness and also creationism belief. And the same sort of mind gets tracked onto both of them. Uh, it's, it's how people deflect information. Now, there are specific instances of where somebody is so tactical in how they're stepping around a data field where they put their ellipsis in, that they really, you, you could call them a liar if you want, or a tortukan, uh, that their brain is just going seizing up. Uh, in the new book that I'm doing with Jackson, there's a piece on uh, Andrew Snelling uh, where he cites a technical paper uh, on this particular issue about, um, uh, I think it's um, uh, an eff effect on um, um, radium decay. Uh, radioactive decay. And it says exactly the opposite of what he claims it does, that, that he puts in a qualifier word that isn't in the original text. Now, either the guy is completely delusional and or um, he is being extremely tactical about how he does all of this stuff. And he has to wrestle with his own conscience on that. But um, I am of the view that the vast majority of people who believe things that aren't true, and it's not just in the creationism case, it's in politics and it's on left and right, it's on a whole bunch of things, uh, that, that most people honestly say what they believe. Whether they have justification for those beliefs, that's a different kettle of fish. Um, that uh, Anonymous says, to be fair, there are some I can't believe are just deflecting. For instance, I once saw YEC Bob Enyart quote two snippets at the beginning and end of a paragraph when the middle disproved his argument. Uh, Enyart's a fascinating case because this guy is a, a, a bottom feeder. He's a secondary redactor. He is not a fact claimant. And uh, it's very possible that he nicked his quote from somebody else who may have done that for him, or a quote from somebody who did some, who copied it from another quote mine before him, who copied it from another quote mine before him. You'd have to track down the original source material. But from what I've seen from Bob Enyard, for those of you who don't know him, he's a kind of a bumptious little a uh, video blogger and audio blogger, and he bites on a bunch of conspiracy theorists and young earth creationists and that all the time. I think he's he's even pushed uh, Ron Wyatt's um, uh, Exodus chariot stuff. Uh, if memory serves me, Bob Enyart was even pushing some of that stuff. But he's he he circulates among the most credulous of the young earth creationists, and, and there's there's almost nobody in the creationism field too stupid for Enyart to draw. on. Randy Dillman says, you say bottom feeder a lot. Is there anyone you don't think is a bottom feeder? Oh, the fact claimants. There are not many of them. Uh, there's about 50 of them in anti-evolutionism. Remember part of my little tip project is to actually catalog all of this stuff? Nobody had ever thought to do this before. A fact claimant is somebody who makes a primary source claim originally. They are, they are making an assertion involving primary source technical data, usually citing a, a actual science material, although theoretically it can involve their own technical work, like the rate group. Uh, at um, uh, the Institute for Creation Research uh, on radiometric decay. Uh, but um, these are people that are, are making the primary source assertions. These are not copyists. If you look at an Enyart or a, 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 Kent, a Kent Hovind or a Ken Ham, these are secondary redactors. Uh, Harun Yahya, uh, secondary redactor. These are not people who are doing their own research. They're copying other people's stuff buffing it with their own style, doing it in their own presentation, but they're not doing original work. So out of some 2,300 anti-evolutionists that I keep track of in the TIP project, and it keeps on growing, although slowly, I, if I add one or two new anti-evolutionists onto the field of my analysis every month, it's a busy month. Um, 
but the the uh, um, the source fact claimants are much much smaller. Uh, there's only about 50 of them. Uh, the uh, majority of them. Uh, oh my gosh! I think I've still got my uh, stupid spreadsheet open. So I will show you uh, the bloody thing. Uh, I've got this. I forgot to take down the file. Um, let me see. There we go. Uh, actually, the number is up to 53 now. Wow. Uh, let me um, put on my um, screen share here. Oh, actually, I better not put that all the way widescreen. Otherwise, you won't be able to see most of it. Uh, doom, doom, doom. And the old RJ attempts to clumsily move his way around the screen share mode again. There we go. Okay, you're looking at my spreadsheet. This is the reference tracking. And uh, there's uh, 53 of them. These are the one. There's Mark uh, Armitage. He's the guy with the Triceratops things. There's Christopher Ashcroft. He actually has some technical thing. Steve Austin, who actually has a geology degree. John Bumgardner, who actually has science degrees. Jerry Bergman, who has some degrees and, and does primary source work, so forth and so on. There are a couple dead ones on the list, Dwayne Gish and Henry Morris, but they're so in influential. David Capage, the guy that got fired from... Um, uh, the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, Frank Shervlin, uh, Jonathan Sarfati, Michael Ord, Paul Nelson, who masquerades as an intelligent designer, but he's a young earth creationist, and so I file him over on that side. Jeffrey Tompkins, who is a geneticist, uh, uh, Royal Truman, Larry Bart Bartman, he's part of that rate group, Carl Wieland, uh, Jay Weil, uh, Kurt Wise, he's actually got a paleontology degree, uh, John Woodmarap, Todd Wood, uh, who's kind of the most honest of the bunch. Then you'll notice that it's so much smaller than the uh, bigger than the intelligent design bunch douglas axe michael b bill dembski uh, michael denton michael egnard and gager uh wolf eckhard lunig it should be an umlaut in there casey luskin who's kind of shut up now since he had a kind of a falling out with them uh scott minnick who's a bacterial flagellum guy steve meyer who i bumped into when he used to be up here at whitworth he's now um pulls out 150 grand at the discovery institute yipes uh fazal rana and you ross are the old earth creationists uh, Granville Sewell is that guy pushing thermodynamic stuff. Uh, David Snoke, uh, Lee Spetner, who um, is a quasi, he's sort of a young earth creationist and not. He pops around in various things. And Richard Sternberg, who's also kind of bumping around in areas. It's hard to tell where he falls and the inimitable Jonathan Wells. Um, uh, I'll give you a quick little run through. Uh, oh, Anonymous asks, was Armitage's horn ever identified to be a triceratops? I think there's no dispute about that. I haven't seen any controversy over that aspect. He argues that the horn is so porous that um, um, the things that he would see would have prevented somehow or other uh, contamination or whatever. And it, it, it's a whole bunch of weird little arguments that he gets into on the stuff. And um, so long as it's just him doing this, he's been act this field for quite a few years so he's been popping up he even pops up as some of the technical advisors for people at the rate group uh anyway um i, I have a, a master summary here where i keep track of all of the the main material that's how i know that i've got uh, 2395 uh, anti-evolutionists of which there are 100 1000 uh, or so intelligent design old earth creationists and 1200 uh, young Earth creationists. There's some 3,000 critics of creationism that I have. Uh, I've got a total of 8,800 uh, sources from the uh, anti-evolution brigade. I've got 25,000 technical papers. And so all of this stuff that I'm using to keep tra track of stuff. And then I have a, a master listing of the um, uh, um, material. This was structured for the future giant Troubles in Paradise online project, which would be in uh, some dozen different uh, subsections in that, but that, that I've been too busy keeping up having to write standalone books in order to keep alive and get some revenue off of that. Uh, then there's a breakdown by what kind of material they are. So general science and evolution tech and anti-creationism and that. So I have a complete listing of that stuff. Uh, there's a chronology listing that helps me actually keep track of things to make sure there may be 15 different Wu et al. 2004s in the, in the bibliography. So you have to make sure that there's no duplication. So it'd have to put them a, a more precise description. A listing of all the different people involved, including ones on the internet that I keep track of. Just in, just recently, there was a swath of Haru and Yaya clones, uh, all of these ones in green, all the different versions of Haru and Yaya people who were coming on to an FFRF thread and, and putting up links to Haru and Yaya material. And I felt, oh gosh, I got to uh, keep a listing of these. And I finally got really, really tired early in the morning and stopped. So this isn't even comprehensive, but it was like 80 some odd people, yipes. Uh, and then um, 
uh, the citation listing, which is a listing. All of the ones in this column here would be uh, technical papers on the human evolution issues cited by anti-evolutionists. And then the, this column over here would be the material that has not been cited by anti-evolutionists so far. And so if I find one that is, I put it over into the other column. Let's go down here and you'll notice that the uh, anti-evolution citation drops off at 411 and the evolution goes on down to, there we go, uh, 1,263. So when I say that um, anti-evolutionists pay attention to only a, a small portion of the data field, I'm not guessing, I am measuring. And nobody has actually done this before. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I keep on rattling my can for the GoFundMe so that I could eventually reach the point where I could actually be kind of scraping along above, scraping along level. Um, um, ink uh, is one issue, uh, eating, um, uh, buying new shoes when they wear out, I'm, you know, the, the, all the kind of fiddly bits. I, I've depended a great deal. This was a donation and the camera that I'm using and the, uh, the microphone I'm using now, all of these things were donations because I don't have enough money to buy this stuff. Uh, I suppose I could hawk all, and all of the stuff behind me, but I, I guarantee you the, the, the market for CDs on obscure 19th century classical composers is relatively limited. So it, that would be just a stopgap here. And I'm a possessive little clod. I kind of want to hold on to what I've accumulated all over the years uh, to build on it. Anyway, um, the TIP project uh, uh, strives, I, I tumble into that aspect of it when I reached the stage where I had so much technical literature under my belt and when I was already accumulating primary source data and when I would get an old paper on uh, some particular issue like turtle evolution, I would track down the sources they were citing and then I would find out what new material had come up and that started producing these packets of, of collected material. And it was at that point, this was about 2013 or so, when it suddenly dawned on me, what if I keep track of what's been cited by them directly? And that means that I would be measuring that perception field. Uh, as an overall number, anti-evolutionists collectively have cited about 15% of my data field, which is that big 25,000 technical paper blob. Uh, but as I can see from works like Rupi and Sanford, that just because you cited it doesn't mean you're playing fair with it. So an awful lot of it is authority quoting, an awful lot of it is misrepresentation. So that 15% is a ceiling that actually should be lower when you take into account how much of it is misrepresented material. And even lower yet, when you realize that my 25,000 technical papers is not the whole data field, it's what I've found. And I'm all, uh, constantly discovering new technical literature and relevant points that I didn't know were it there because they're in relatively uh, niche market specialization journals. I cover about I bumped into about 1,800 uh, technical journals that uh, have generated those various articles. And it's physically impossible for anybody. There's not enough time in the day for me to monitor every single one of those things uh, on their continual thing. So I, I hit proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences and Science and Nature as my hitters uh, that I go every week, uh, that they're the top of the peak. And then gradually through the social networking, particularly on Twitter, any scientist who is on a Twitter feed, uh, I make a point of following them. If they're one of those that's in my bibliography as somebody that's write, written some of the papers that I've drawn on, and they're on Twitter, like, duh, I'm going to go ahead and follow them. And they're giving me heads up on new, but just today, there was a brand new paper that I didn't know about um, on um, uh, some hominid uh, data that I go, ooh, gee, I didn't know about that. Oh, it was uh, Neanderthal brains. There was a new um, uh, virtual reconstruction of the Neanderthal brain thing because they've got so much information on it now from so many different sources and, and a brand new paper that was in um, uh, science advances, but I had not tumbled onto it. Uh, uh, and uh, so that goes into the mix that I didn't realize. So the idea being, that what I can do, anybody can do. And what you want is a collective where everybody is interlocking information much, much better than before. So individually, we don't have to know absolutely everything. We only need to be able to get in touch with somebody who knows whatever it is we need. And so that we get ahead of the game and stop playing reaction. Um, uh, that the, the, the worst possible circumstance is when you are being hit blindsided 
by some weird little technical blip that some creationist is scavenged from somewhere or other, and you don't know anything at all about it. You can't research that on the fly in the middle of a discussion or a debate. You know that. No, you need to already be aware of some of this stuff. And I'm arguing that in 2018, there's no excuse for us not to be ahead of them because we know sound method and we've got accessibility to the information and we know how bloody lazy anti-evolutionists are when it comes to primary source research. They have the curiosity of a block of wood. Uh, they literally won't check up on stuff. That's how they believe what they do because they won't do that follow-up research. And um, uh, that is um, um, a, uh, one of the, the core methods issues that I'm trying to make uh, um, more and more people aware of and hopefully get more and more people making use of. It's not a natural thing to do, that source methods approach. We naturally will latch on to pundits that reinforce us and it saves us time. We can listen to the pundit and the, the Jerry Coyne posting and go, yeah, not wonderful, and then move on. We don't have to do any work. Uh, but that's a thing that we, more of us need to wean ourselves away from because that's functionally what our opponents are doing. They just have a different set of stuff that they're following their pundits and then not following up on it. And I guarantee you, the more you follow up on the primary source information, the more you learn. And the more you learn, the less blindsided that you need to be. So I, 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 I left Dinesh D'Souza dangling incomplete. Um, Dinesh shoots his mouth off all the time on the stupid uh, uh, climate change. Well, not all that much. It's not a big deal for him. Uh, but he um, uh, asserted that this time around in one of his little tweets, he linked to a Fox News posting about this uh, issue about how Neanderthals weathered or not climate change back in the Ice Age, 40,000 years ago. And it was in turn a link to another advanced print at PNAS. And I put the link to that up too, because it's open access so anybody can follow up on it. It has nothing to do with whether or not our use of fossil fuels in the 21st century are affecting climate. Of course, climate has oscillated up and down. Sometimes it's been warm, sometimes it's been cold. The point is that the climatologists understand a lot about those processes and why they happen and how volcanic activity and plate movements and longer climate cycles, uh, the, 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 how far away from we are during the sun at the moment, we are the closest to the sun when it's in the winter in the Northern hemisphere. Um, 25,000 years ago, it was the other way around to where we were the closest during the winter in the southern uh, uh, hemisphere. And uh, that alters the dynamics of things and changes the circumstances of why uh, temperature cycles work the way they do. Um, the idea that this somehow or other made modern climate science go away is nonsense. And I see no evidence whatsoever that Dinesh has ever thought to look up any of the science work. Or would he understand it if he did? Would he suddenly get terribly bogged down with all sorts of unfamiliar terminology and his brain fry? I don't know, but I don't think he's ever getting that close to it. And repeatedly, he will rely on secondary sources that he doesn't bother to fact check. And that is exactly the same problem you find with creationists, with 9-11 uh, conspiracy theorists, with flat earthers, with everybody but uh, uh, Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare's plays, the same methodology. It's just a different veneer of objects of desire. Uh, there was a comment in the live feed there um, that uh, um, uh, antediluvian says and notes in these debates, no one ever looks up the claim and put the evidence up on the screen. To be fair, it's hard to do that real time unless you've got somebody who's a fact checker, who's Johnny on the spot, quickie quickie, and has access to the feed. I, I don't begrudge them that. It's not easy to be able to do that live online. Uh, with me, look at me. If, if I tried to do a search like that, I could open up my reference bibliography and hunt around for stuff and all that. But now I'm clogging up my feed and I'm probably going to start roboting. And pretty soon, eek, uh, we're in a terrible situation. So uh, the idea being that you want to ideally know the information in advance. Um, oh, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Peter's late. Well, you can you can jump in. You've got the link to the uh, uh, the room if you want to pop in. Um, Peter's the guy that did my opening logo, so um, he has a certain deferential position right off the bat because uh, um, pretty little clicky clacks and all that is uh, is his doing. Um, but the thing is, is that um, one advantage that we have with most anti-evolutionists and most ideologues generally is they're not terribly original. 
they're repeating the same shtick over and over and over and over and over again. So if they've got a paper trail or even a video trail, which is a, a more laborious thing to track, but it's still there. Uh, I know by direct experience, for me, it's much harder to track down the goofs in a video presentation because the information content is so low, no matter who's doing it, uh, and, and too much verbiage. And you have to wade through, what, an hour of stuff to find something where suddenly you go, whoop. Whereas written text, you have a much better chance of finding the, the point where you're going, oop, that's where the shell game is. Aha, got it. Uh, it's easier to spot in written texts. But if you've got a, a, a uh, Kent Hovind will be a test case in here because uh, I'm going to hopefully be nailing him on uh, one of the videos that he just did a couple months ago. Vacus Opterix. And holy moly, was that dumb. And so I've got him doing his bad practices still, and we'll see what happens uh, uh, tomorrow, assuming, of course, the debate actually comes across, because he has been known to waffle out of things somehow because of, oh, there's some problem with his cell phone or something uh, mysterious occurred, or we just forgot about it or not. But we'll find out uh, one way or another. Um, as the technology improves, of course, we're, I'm representing... A, a learning curve here. I started out with a very rudimentary camera system and a rudimentary microphone, and now I'm on a more sophisticated camera and a more sophisticated microphone, and um, I still have bandwidth problems, so there's, there's software that theoretically could improve my presentation, so I would be showing videos and stuff, but I haven't worked out how to make that work effectively. Um, even people who are more expert at it than I am find it sometimes difficult sharing stuff that's got audio feeds, uh, and they don't know whether or not they have the rights to the audio feed. So we're all still kind of clumsily around on this level. But there's no doubt that younger generation people who will be able to do at text speed uh, interconnectivity, if they've got the information available to them and know how to find it and how to access it and coordinate it effectively, uh, they're going to be able to do way better than, than clumsy old oafs like me uh, at the moment. But the method is still the same. And that always needs to be the dynamic of it. Uh, anonymous in there, that's exactly why creation is like live debate. It's all about those Snapple facts, which aren't really facts. Uh, oh yeah, and and structured debates. Uh, Kent immediately wanted to go with a fixed format of uh, a 12 minute opening statement and a 10 minute rebuttal, and then a eight minute uh, end piece, and then a 30 minute Q and A. And this is not at all surprising. Why? Because he's got all of his little patter down cold. So he can spoo through in his time frame, and he's happy, happy, joy, joy. Hello, Peter. There's a little Einstein image there with the eyeball. Say something. <laughs> ah, well, he's he's away in uh, in Holland, and uh, um, uh, it does a lot of interesting little graphic work. I'll I'll do a um, a nudge and plug here that uh, theoretically. Uh, oh, he probably has some bandwidth problems. He'll have to come in again. Um, uh, the um, um, there's a map of time at my website that um, is a convenient short thing, and somebody had suggested what a neat idea it would be to have it as a T-shirt, and I would like to do that as a T-shirt. And uh, uh, Peter hopefully can do some of the graphics in that to do a mo and a bunch of things. We should have stuff that has the Tortukan concept. And there's a whole bunch of things that we can do graphically on a lot of different themes. There's a whole line of damn T-shirts. I'm uh, still I'm still not happy with the design, James. Well, the, I'm, we'll I'm, work I'm working on I'm working on it, and and so work has been a little bit crazy uh, the the past few few days. But uh, hi, James. Hello, hello, you're seeing me widescreen, high definition, kind of, sort of, now. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, so, um, I, I was, I was, un I was concerned as to whether or not it would have any effect upon the feed or not, and apparently it hasn't, so that means that it's been a seamless transition from one to the other. I just screwed up with uh, making my first test uh, recording where I sent the poor, poor Cirrus a raw data file rather than the file he needed. So I'm going to have to have a, a little chit chat with him later on to uh, figure out what the hell I did wrong. But remember, I'm an old oaf from the 19. <laughs> I grew up in the 1950s. All of this is miraculous magic technology to me. I'm communicating with people here. I've got a guy in the room that's on another continent and we have instantaneous communication. 
and I'm having people all over the world that can theoretically see this and people at their leisure watching it later on. That was something I couldn't imagine that I would be doing 50 years later. We, we all have to adjust a little bit. So I, to me, for me, it's a hobby. So maybe that's why it comes a little bit easier mm. for me. You, you have well, a better hobby. Tool. You have, you have a better hobby tool. than me and make whatever I can of it. But the, the purpose that I'm doing here is deadly serious that I don't, I want to have everybody armed as effectively as possible with the best possible evidence that we have. So that our game is at full speed to where we're assessing and collating and organizing the information field way ahead of the creationists. And so when you bump into a creationist, uh, I, I prefer it when I encounter some things where I, uh, see them citing some new technical work. I look into my bibliography and I find I've already got it in there and I'm just moving it from this column over to that column, bingo, and then we can start processing it. In other words, they're not taking me by surprise. They're now doing what I was anticipating. And I can see a lot of things like that um, uh, Neanderthal brain paper. I'll be curious to see if and when anti-evolutionists pick up on it or not. Uh, and uh, some subjects that get discussed and some others. Uh, shameless book plug for Evolution Slam Dunk. The reason why I did the damn thing is A, to make money, but B, because it was an area that was completely uncovered. There were no books that told you about both the reptile mammal transition and how anti evolutionists had covered it. You can get the some of the data side. Robert Prothero had a section on it in his book and that, but nothing really on how creationists had done it. And uh, the, what little you could find was really old stuff that related to Dwayne Gish in the 1980s. Well, no, we got to get up to speed on this. So I, I compiled everything and, and I'm very proud of it. And uh, Jackson Wheaton and I are doing the same sort of thing for the Answers book to hit uh, young earth creationism in the same way that we have done, uh, that I did the reptile mammal transition. And it's going to be neat. <laughs> well, I'm actually, having fun. Yeah, actually, that's something that I've I've that I'm going to look forward to because Jackson and I talked a little bit about that and Jackson is extremely excited about doing that. So, yeah. And I, I, I also most of the heavy lifting in that most of the chapter stuff is his stuff. And then I buff it and, and keep track of a lot of the geek things in terms of compiling indexing and uh, uh, making sure that the source citations are all up to speed. He might refer to a book and he didn't have a reference to it in the bibliography. So I fill all of that stuff up because I'm, I'm very good at that. That's just mother's milk to me, that kind of detailed fiddling. And then uh, there's some issues that he may not be aware of. Then he handed me the radiometric dating chapter, uh, which I'd done a bit on and now I'm diving into it full speed uh, to where um, uh, it, uh, I only need to finish the stuff on the um, uh, Cardenas basalt issue in the Grand Canyon to have vaporized uh, Austin and Snelling on the heavy guns that Mike Riddle put forward in his radiometric dating chapter. I've already taken care of the first one, this Beartooth uh, case that is just pathetically bad. And the key turned out to be something really ironically simple. Uh, when I filed um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Riddle puts up a little chart where he's got the um, uh, stuff in group by the radiometric dating used to do it. And so they have all these dates scattered all over the place. What I did was put them in chronological order according to what they came up with on the dates. And when the moment you saw that, you could see that there was clustering going on with why some of the dates seemed discordant. We know exactly why they're discordant because they're 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 remeltings that reset the clock. There's things that easily leak argon. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff that and and worse that Austin and Snelling knew about it. They knew about all of these caveats, but they tiptoed around them and tiptoed around them and tiptoed around them to the tactical point of where oh boy, we're we're seeing the shell game here. We're seeing the way the magic trick is going. But you need to put. Austin, you need to put the handkerchief in front of the hat before you pull the rabbit out this time, because we can see you doing the trick. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I'm. Here's why I'm I'm curious about how that book's going to work out because if Jackson's videos are something to go by and he he can put it in book form as good as he can put stuff in 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 a video, and you with the facts, we're, we're going to have the best of 
both oh, worlds. Yeah, yeah. In, I, in I think it's book. going to be a, a real killer analysis because uh, we're we're going uh, uh, after uh, the whole range of that answers uh, in Genesis apologetics, and I'm directly connecting it up with that source methods thing that we'll be seeing over and over again. Uh, I guarantee you that um, Jackson writes the way he talks, and so do I. So uh, we, we the, our, our fun point is to try to mesh our styles in such a way that it's a nice, smooth narrative structure. Uh, okay, so... Uh, but, so oh, it, it's going to be a fun, <clears throat> fun, fun so, one. So, so the book is going to start out with, let's jump right in. And not, then, quite, and, not quite. And, and, That's and, his catchphrase for the videos. Yeah, but yeah, uh, and, and, uh, he didn't. He didn't use that phrase in the um, uh, in the book context. I'll, I'll uh, have to, our I'll title have to, is going to be James. The, James, the rocks oh, are still there. James, hold on. I, I have to talk to him about this because the book needs to start with "Let's jump right in," and then in the middle of the book, <laughs> we need a shame a shameless book plug for Evolution Slam Dunk. <laughs> ah, well, we don't have to be that anal retentive literal on it. Uh, um, he, he's the one that it, he structured the general chapter structure. And the one thing I had to advise him on is to keep it fixed. That once we settle on a structure, let's not tinker with it much. Because I guarantee you, it's really hard to revise an argument if you suddenly decide to move a chapter from one position to another. Because now you have to go back and figure out when you brought up the first topic and then rearrange your internal descriptions to make it. So, you mm -hmm. know, get a, get a structure, stick with it, and then work with it. And so once we've got onto that frame, and of course he's busy with college. So he's got tests and stuff to do and all sorts of actual real things in addition to doing this on the side. But between the two of us, I think we're having fun. Uh, I enjoy what I'm doing on it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm very proud of what I've come on with it. I've learned lots of new material that I didn't even realize before that I, that was out there. So my game is now upped. I'm improved. And it also means that we're taking on some really big guns. Uh, uh, Austin and Snelling and Vardaman and company are the, the heavy guns on the whole rape team. And to dismantle them means we've just knocked the props out of their primary cannonade. And then uh, we're also going after uh, 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 Jeffrey Tompkins uh, and because that the chromosome two issue, that's another one that, that there's been a little bit of criticism on it, but not nearly enough. Bodie Hodge, uh, their various arguments, uh, uh, Georgia Purdom uh, and her biological material. Oh, he's, he's just been having fun finding the material on that. And then I'll be connecting that up with my source background data um, to make sure that like I did in the first book, that anybody who doesn't know this area at all will get a general concept of who the players are and what the issues are and background historical context and a lot of stuff that it, it'll be a one-stop compendium and plug that in with Slam Dunk. And those are going to be two important works in the field. And gosh, I wish more people were aware of the first one. <laughs> uh, well. We, we, we still have to figure out something to get that out as well. So if if what what you said about Tartukan merchandise, I think that's something you need to go. Yeah, yeah. With. You want and, to, and you come up with a, a graphic of the Tartukan uh, mind in its natural habitat and to get the concept across. Um, that um, that graphic that we had a, a, a knockdown drag out about about the atheist deist thing. That's another uh, potential visual uh, that could be a, a fun one. Uh, and uh, uh, um, there's there's a lot of little phrases and things that can pop up in addition to the map of time. So I can see quite a lot of product line that can be used, some that are very graphic and catchy and others that have a little bit more text element to them. Obviously, the map of time does that um, can appeal to a broad range of people and then have multiple versions of them for different visual aesthetics as well. And uh, I, I think, we, yeah, we got a little product line. Hell, if Nike can do it, can't we? I, th I think so. So with, that's something we might need to, to focus on. And and if you got something graphic, at least have have uh, something a, a, a link to the book or a link to the website on everything as well. Yeah, that that would be easy. Uh, actually, the main website would be the easiest form because I put links to all the books and stuff there. Yeah. Uh, and of course, eventually, I want to have a much more user friendly format on that. That's going to take time to deal with one thing at a time, one thing at a time. Uh, there's some side chat here. Brian is having about uh, Armitage and his Triceratops thing. Uh, I don't actually think anybody has attempted to date it. 
I don't know that that uh, Armitage is claiming at all that he's like done a radiocarbon dating thing on it. He's just arguing that these little squishy soft tissue stuff that he's somehow been able to find uh, uh, that that to him contends that this couldn't possibly be um, from uh, um, uh, an old object. And so it's in, intrinsically has to be very, very young. But the problem with the osteocytes, I think I did a little bit on this in one of the previous evolution hours. The osteocytes involved are ones that actually form almost instantaneously on their own. They can start mineralizing in living tissues, let alone ones that are, that are 100,000 years old. So the idea that that stuff wouldn't get folded into um, uh, eventually fossilizing triceratops thing and then trapped down inside of little fragments inside of that porous bone are going to be little splodge of stuff that you have to see under a, a, a high-powered microscope uh, isn't at all implausible. But um, Armitage is, is wedded to the young earth creationist dogma, and so he wants to spin everything in that direction, and the rest of the scientific community kind of goes, okay, uh, uh, Mark, uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, keep us informed. <laughs> yeah, and so that one paper, that's the one that, that, that where it a, a lot of creationists do stuff that's sort of surreptitious and um, uh, under the wire to where they have um, uh, Wood, Woodmerap is the most snotty example because he, his actual name is Jan Pekschitz. And um, he did evolution papers with the clear intent of then using them as ammunition that he would cite as the creationist saying about, look at this terrible evolution propaganda. And that, that's the weirdest that I've ever seen. Uh, Andrew Snelling, at least, never done, uh, does anything under a pseudonym. He writes occasionally perfectly fine little micromanaged uh, technical papers and gets published in the regular science literature. But then his main creationist stuff, that he has to do in the uh, creationist journals. But that is useful because we don't have to guess then of what he thinks a science paper is supposed to look like. He prints them. So we can then look through and look at his sources. He's very heavily weighted. Uh, Snelling stuff will have dozens and does 70, 80, 90 citations. I mean, it's a lot of technical paper and it takes time to wade through. But when you look at the points of how he uses the data points, point by point by point, now fast and loose here, this is not good scholarship. And so that's why the, the argument begins to fall apart when you look at it at the, at the, uh, the detail level. Uh, Anonymous says, I know Gary Hurd has told me through email, he and a few others from Forens aren't even sure it's Triceratops, but maybe an Ice Age bison. Well, that's the case. Holy moly. Um, that um, uh, that would be an interesting issue. I, I wouldn't be surprised that it was a Triceratops. Um, the thing that, that uh, was fascinating about uh, Schweitzer's work is that they haven't been just restricted to dinosaurs. She's done a bunch of stuff on turtles and other fossil animals where they've been able to find uh, soft tissues as well. And I think I put some links up to a bunch of them in one of the recent uh, um, evolution hours on there. It's a, it's a lot of stuff to, to uh, um, keep. Uh, oh, they did try to date it. Let's see. Nature.com. Let me uh, put that. Let's find out about that little link. I may have to look into that uh, in due course. See what this is how I get information, Brian. I find out stuff and then I will find out in due course whether or not it's in my bibliography or not. And if it is, then I'll check to see on follow up. And if it isn't, I'll make a point of putting it in. So that means my knowledge base suddenly gets bigger and it gets clearer one way or the other. Um, that's, that's how a cooperative effort ought to work. We're in the internet era. This I'll bang my little horn here because we're just about, we're already past the hour. Uh, that, that, that's the technique that we want to make use of. We have all of this information potentially available. We have instantaneous communication that's global, and it's not trimmed yet by the powers that be. So let's make the most of it. And let's not let any wooist, let alone creationists, get away with claptrap when we can call them to account on it and all demand that everybody plays the source methods game. Because I guarantee you, Tortugans cannot do source methods. It's not that they're bad at it, which they are, it's their brains literally don't think that way. They don't tell the difference between a primary and a secondary source. I bet every one of you that's bumped into a creationist has been finding ones where they, it, they don't get it that when they see a quote from Charles Darwin that they have read in a quote line, that they think they've read Charles Darwin. From a scholarly methods point of view, no, they haven't. They have read somebody's claim about what was in Charles Darwin. 
And only when you read the Darwin directly do you now have the context for it, and now you see what they see and what they wrote before and after, and you discover what was left out and all of that. Only then can you claim to have read Charles Darwin. Uh, but coal miners literally can't tell the difference on this. And the, the this little guy, um, uh, oh, um, I've forgotten his little moniker there. Um, he was, um, we were, we've been in a discussion, and he's a hyper presuppositionalist. And um, uh, I think he was in a discussion with Jackson Weeder. Maybe he was on one of your shows. I can't remember, uh, Peter. Um, I, I don't bother about that too much, about who gets into what afterwards. But anyway, he, uh, the idea was that he might want to appear on uh, my show, and I didn't want him to repeat his endless discussions about uh, presuppositions and the definition of um, evolution, because that's just around and around the mulberry bush, and you never get the data. Defin definitions have no meaning until you apply them to something. And he finally declined just in an email today saying, no, uh, I want to discuss these issues. Well, no, it's pointless. Uh, I want to uh, quiz him about his source methods. I want to find out where he's getting his material from. I want to find out about how he does fact checking or does he? Those are, I think, legitimate discussions to go into. And that would immediately expose why he wants to stick with definitions because there's no there there. He thinks that Charles Jackson and uh, oh, um, Carl Kirby are uh, science resources that he can draw on reliably when they're not. They're, they're secondary redactor young earth creationists, and he is bottom feeding them. And that's as be uh, best as it can go. Uh, we got a thing in here, um, antediluvian atheist, and yet you poke holes in the bubble there all about context. Context, context, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's double standards goes on um, uh, relentlessly. Uh, in anti-evolutionism and in, in Wu thinking generally. If you look at any ideologue, they have one set of standards for themselves and another set of standards for what they don't like. And you find that in politics, you find it in ideologies in addition to religion. And it's the same dynamic going on at that Tortukan level of uh, where they literally can't see internal contradictions. They can't see that they're doing double standards. And it doesn't depend on whether they're brilliant or not, that, that the same problem occurs across that whole spectrum. And I all regard it as a, a, a subset of that Tortugan mind shell, that they have the object of desire that they want, and it's what they can see out the head of the, the, the shell, and nothing else matters, and information bounces off only if it's something that's within the shell's perspective, that, oh, now that I can use, boop, and then they glom onto it. And when you see somebody like an Andrew Snelling looking at that, they're cherry picking and parsing and looking to see the thing that's going to fit what they need to be true. And if a portion of their brain is going, well, the reason why we're not going to mention that is because that's a problem. The Tortukan thing pretty soon washes it away, and they don't have to bother about that at all. Um, so it's why the, the, the thing is that in the end, uh, oh, antediluvian atheist says, do you think we can fix them or just wait for them to die off? I, a Tortukanosity, is not, uh, there is no cure. Uh, that Tortukans are mindsets that occur this way naturally, I think. They can be reinforced by culture, and a little bit of it can be dampened by the culture. But I think people who have this kind of mindset are that way. And I don't think it's simplistically genetic to where the son of a Tortukan is going to be a Tortukan necessarily. You can have a fresh crop all the time. I think it's a stochastic phenomenon. Uh, it occurs across the spectrum. I bumped into atheist Tortukans and 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 right wing left wing uh, ideologue uh, Tortukans just as much as right wings, uh, but they they manifest in different ways in different contexts. The main thing is to be able to identify the phenomenon, and one way you do it is by questions. If you suspect somebody has a Tortukan rut, if you expect suspect I have a Tortukan rut, and you ask me a question about it, and you get this long deer in the headlight moment. And the answer that comes out of my mouth isn't to the question you asked. That's a Tortukan rat. And you just bounced off the mind shell. Uh, and that will occur that uh, fairly regularly. So the, what questions to ask? Anybody should be able to think about a question. They may not give you a good answer to it. They may not, you may not like the answer that they give. But boy, uh, when you can't even get to that stage, look at that discussion that I had with Cy Van Tendenbroeke or whatever his name was, where he was just going on and on and on about the definition of truth. And Cy Van Yeah, yeah, I, I, I mangle his name. I, I, it's got too many syllables in it. Uh, and I, too sp many. I, I, sp I spoke to him last week. <laughs>
Yeah, he, 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 the, he and the little guy that, that declined to show, uh, show up on my show are exactly the same mindsets. They're hyper presuppositionalists. They're ones that dive into a particular little niche that they want to defend that's their happy zone. And they can't move out of it. They can't think about anything beyond it because there's no there there. And you ought to be able to do that. Um, uh, you, you, I think, you I think, your I think, move on. I think with Sites and Broken Kate is different because Sites and Broken Kate, I, so he, I had him on my show. And um, what I did is I had a, a small bio, uh, a three minute bio that I uh, put in there at the beginning of, of our show, in which he pretty much tells us that all the creationist arguments are terrible mm. and they, that he could no longer defend them because he looked into them and, and realized that they were terrible ar arguments. And, and then, did and then he have in replacement? Then he went on Google and on Google, he found presuppositionalism, and that's easy because presuppositionalism comes down to one thing. I watched I watched him uh, teach people presuppositionalism, and he said, "I can do that in thirty seconds. Mm -hmm. You read you read the the Bible, you believe the Bible, and everything it says is true." Ta -da. And that's it. Yeah, and, and that's and it. So that that yeah, that would be somebody that. Uh, their mind is uncomfortable with the fiddly bits. They can't deal with the fiddly bits. So you narrow it down to the thing that you can do just by saying cuz. Yes. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a pretty good way to weasel out of every question ever possible because well, it's, now it's this, comfort this, means, this means that you can actually decide what's real and what's not. Yeah. And of course, the, the, the thing that we, had I been able to get far enough down the road with him, he was contending that reality, truth is what maps, uh, it relates to reality. And I would have gone, and in that case, we know that there's a whole bunch of things in the Bible that aren't true because they don't comport to reality, the age of the earth, a lot of that kind of stuff. But we never got to that stage because he was just going around and around this presuppositional merry-go-round. And, and uh, oh, now I remember. It was on Steve McRae because Steve McRae really didn't want to come in. McRae has his own presupposition axes to grind. And so between the two of them, you know, that, it, it was an unproductive discussion. <coughs> anyway, uh, well, we're past the um, uh, hour quite a bit on there. And uh, uh, yeah, I could, I'll, I'll do as a joke, you know, that we might have someday a Tortucan telethon, you know. Here, here is little Billy. Poor Billy suffers from Tortucanosity. As yet, there is no cure. Will you uh, uh, help us uh, find a cure for this? But because I think it's a, a deep-seated cognitive structure that maps in fairly early, before, before you ever get to school, and it might be theoretically reinforced by some genetic components. Uh, there may be certain propensities on it. Uh, but the fact that it pops up in so many different cognitive contexts and so many different ideologies where content is irrelevant, that's the whole point behind the Tortuga model. It's completely independent of content. It's method, not content. Um, that uh, Lord Crocker scores is, why do you expect better than circling the drain from precepts? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a comforting drain. I mean, you know, that if they, if they try to deal with the data field, the drain is so big that their little head can spin during the centrifugal force that occurs around that. You know, it's like trying to run this merry-go-round at 80 miles an hour. Uh, you get an Alfred Hitchcock movie out of that one. But uh, this, this doesn't surprise me at all. So the, the point of methods approach is to try to find where in their frame they are bumping into or not bumping into source data. Because even presuppositionalists, theoretically, your psi guy got his presupposition argument from somebody so he's using a model for how he's thinking, and that too can be analyzed by a source methods approach. It's all fun. Uh, Andy Deluvian Atheist says, as Aaron Ross pointed out, he's not believing the Bible, he's believing in his interpretation in, of it, and has said that if God himself disagrees with the Bible, he's going to ignore God. Yeah, the other versions don't apply. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so now uh, uh, RJ is in, the desiccated RJ is now in a higher resolution video format and theoretically a better uh, audio format and much, much more left to do. And then we got to wake around because um, uh, I do want to hear that stupid um, uh, debate between uh, Nathaniel Jensen and Herman May, which is going on as we speak. 
on uh, Steve McRae's channel. And so I want to get over and, and catch a, a view of that to find out what is said or not said, because from a methods point of view, uh, it's certainly James, relevant. To, James, yeah. can, can, can I ask for a little shameless plug? Uh, so your, your talk with uh, Kent Hovind, when, when's that going to oh, be? Theoretically, at, at what time? tomorrow at five o'clock, I don't have a web link for it because it hasn't been settled yet. Uh, it's, uh, let me pull up my little blurb here on that. Um, it's uh, Modern Day Hysteria is hosting the thing. That's um, at James Joseph K on Twitter. And so I'm going to be hitting him up well in advance on this. And if I have links to it in advance, I'm going to be passing them around as long as I can until I have to shut down in order to be able to get on the feed. And then, of course, uh, I'll be wanting to keep a cut and paste available of the actual web address and all that kind of stuff so that, in principle, people later on can make a look at it. Uh, and have you, do, 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 do you have any any topics that you specifically oh, want to uh, no, no, no specific topic per se. It's it's uh, Kent uh, wanted um, uh, to have his uh, standard debate format, and I was uh, perfectly happy to do that because I have my own things I want to say. So I have already rehearsed my 12 minutes of where I'm, what I'm going to say, and I already have a notion of what I'm going to be saying for my eight-minute summary in the end. And then the 10-minute rebuttal will be a winged improv thing where I'll be taking notes and so forth uh, with what he has. But I'll be aiming at it. Uh, um, I, I know what he's going to say in a large context. Fossils don't mean anything. Uh, the uh, microevolution can't lead to macroevolution. The textbooks have a bunch of frauds in them, which feeds into my discussion about the fraudulency of the claims that he made in his Facus Opterix thing. And I actually gave uh, modern day uh, um, uh, hysteria the link to the video that I did on that very point. So that has all the references and stuff in there. They can't say that they can't figure out what, what, what guns I'm going to fire. <laughs> and if he wants to try to uh, undermine them in advance, I'll adapt my discussion accordingly. <laughs> Yeah, well, what he's going to say is is pretty much going to be standard. I mean, that's that's in every debate he's going to throw up the same thing. So it would yeah. be there, you could you could you could make a rebuttal in in what he's going to say in advance. Yeah, and that, to that me, the whole, I'm thing. coming at it from a direction that he hasn't been hit with, which is source methods, and I'm going to be discussing the uh, example that he had about the shrinking sun, which is topical because Matt Powell was repeating that claptrap just this year with Jackson. And then, of course, the Fakus Opterix thing was just a couple months ago. So uh, this is not some old-fashioned stuff. Uh, this is current. And uh, that the level of incompetence, the level of fakery and stupidity on his part for 2018 is so egregious that any kid in a uh, junior high school uh, paper who did these sorts of mistakes would get an F. And rightly yeah. so. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So I'll be happy to deal with that stuff. And I've got my stuff all prepped for it. And uh, we will see what happens, assuming, of course, it actually comes across. And uh, so there's a, a busy little time undoing stuff that I'm, I've got so many irons in the fire. And the one advantage of all of that is that so long as I can keep my brain from frying from worry for over finances uh, and go from one day to the next, I've got the work to keep me going because I'm, I'm loving the work I'm doing, even if I haven't been able to see any darkness at the end of the tunnel yet on finances. Okay. Uh, so oh, uh, Andy, oh, oh, gosh. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, I think uh, I can probably... Uh, Andy Deluvian wants a link to the Fakus Opterix vid, and I've got... All I have to do is to pull up uh, my file, which may or may not take a bit to uh, pull up. That's the difficulties of the limitations of my computer system. Um, okay, and I just need to pull up the video addresses and I will have that up. Yay! And it was back. Um, I was channeling Haru and Yaya. Yeah. I was back on uh, July 6th or June 6th, June 6th it was. And there you go. There's the link to the YouTube thing. And there are sources in there that link to uh, Kent's video and to uh, the Harun Yaya posting and to Alan Fiducia's paper and to uh, Richard Prum's rebuttal uh, and so forth. So I've got all my little ducks in a row on that one. And we'll see whether or not that leads to anything important or not. 
Uh, okay, well, we're way past uh, the hour on this one. Uh, thank you, Peter, for showing up. And uh, um, uh, my inaugural better resolution run to make sure that everything worked appropriately. And um, we'll be covering the next things in the next shows and uh, slugging away as best I can and source methods forever. Become a methodologist, man, and use hashtag Tortugan alert on Twitter. Make the damn thing trending. Doesn't do a damn bit of good if nobody reads or uses it. So uh, thank you very much, gang. Uh, I will be stopping the broadcast. Uh, help in any way you can.